the blows of a million years and it'll do so to the end. It was born when time did not exist and it grew up out of life. It cut down evil strangly veins like a slashing Syrian knife. It lit fires when fires were not and it burnt the minds of man, tempering leaden hearts to steel from the time that time began. It wept by the waters of Babylon and when all men were lost it screeched in writhing agony and hung bleeding from the cross. It died and roamed by line and sword, and the fine cruel array, when the deadly word of Spartacus along the Appian Way. It marched with what the tailors poured, a frightened Lord and King, and it was embezzled in every deadly stare as e'er a living thing. It smiled in holy innocence before conquistadors of old, so meek and tame and unaware of the deadly power of gold. It burst through pitiful Paris streets and stormed the old Bastille. Marched upon the serpent's head and crushed it neath the tail. It died in blood in buffalo plains, and starved in five mills and rain. Its heart was buried by wounded knee, but it'll come to rise again. It screeched aloud by Kerry Lakes as it was knelt upon the ground, and it died a great defiance as they coldly put it down. It is found in every light of hope, it knows no bounds nor space. It has risen in red, black and white, and is there in every race. It lies in the hearts of heroes dead, it screeches tyrants' eyes, screams in tyrants' eyes. It has reached the peak of mountains high, it comes searing across the skies. It lights the dark of this prison cell, thunders forth its might. It is the indomitable thought, my friend, the thought that says I'm right. Uh, the talk I'm going to do here today is going to be obviously focused around the 1981 hunger strike, but it's also I'm going to interspersed it with a bit of my own personal uh, recollections of that particular time of some of the people like Bobby Sands, who you met the team that I knew too well. That uh, the times in the hate blocks from my own time from 1976 until 1979, when I look back on it, uh, how brutal the regime was and we can talk about uh, the current situation now in prisons. I'm going to just talk on that uh, very briefly. I'm sure I'm saying that if, if, uh, once I stop speaking, if any of you have any questions, not about what I've been talking about myself on a personal level, or my own recollections of that particular period, or 
sort of controversies around uh, the allegations and speculation about what's said about uh, the hunger strike and how it finished, especially after the death of uh, around the before and after the death of Joe McDonald up to Mickey Levine. <coughs> so, we're looking at the whole history thing about hunger strike, as we, as we know that uh, we're talking about the 20th century of, of hunger strikes, the first Republican uh, prisoner to die on hunger strike died in this particular uh, uh, city was Thomas Ice in September uh, 1917. And since then, obviously prior to it as well, but, and since then the Republicans have been embarking on, on protests in jails, whether it be in jails in Ireland, in Britain, or in Europe, wherever re Republican prisoners were. And the main focus of, of the protests were over the issue of criminalisation. Those terms make me news prior to 1981. But the British have always tried to criminalise our struggle, with, uh, from especially from the, the, the Fenian rising of the 1860s. But in 1969, when the, the outbreak of the conflict in, in the, the six counties, especially, the, when Republicans were starting to be imprisoned, the regime in, in jails, from what I was told about and read about, was very lax. There were very few uh, of any political prisoners in, in jails, in Armagh Arma jail and criminal jail in Belfast. So, in 18, uh, whenever things started to, to build up, more and more people were being uh, lifted, being captured. Uh, some after internment in August 1971, obviously people had political status as a, as a given. Uh, people, the, the, the British refer to as detainment. Uh, people were detained in uh, Maidstone prison ship just based on Belfast Law, from an old jail, and uh, McGilligan in County Derry. In 1972, a number of men were on pro uh, hunger strike in Belfast jail and also Armagh jail for political status. And this is a time in which the IRA, especially in the, in, in, in the six counties, was very strong militarily. It was a, in military terms, you know, we can all uh, things be quantified in whatever way we're looking at, but uh, the IRA was, uh, was gaining momentum, uh, and was especially in Republic and Irish in Belfast and Derry, Armagh and Uri, but especially Belfast and Derry. There was also a time in which, and I'm not going to have your opinion on uh, the, the time that the ceasefire was called in 1872, when a delegation of uh, not all IRA people, as far as I remember, went over to Cheney Place in, in London. One of, the one of the delegates claimed he was never in the IRA. Has a beard and with glasses. It's not me. It's Jerry Adams. <laughs> so he, they went over there as a delegation. And one of one of the the, the this was a hunger strike was taking place at this time. Led by Billy McKee and Francis McHart in Belfast. Obviously, there was more there was more men than those two were on the hunger strike, but they were among the few best known Republicans in Belfast. Two IRA members, and there was a small number of prisoners who were on hunger strike in Armagh. Male men uh, in Armagh, even though there was women in Armagh at that time. In fact, uh, uh, my own sister, the eldest sister, was in jail uh, in Armagh at that time. So this hunger strike was one of, uh, sorry, one of the uh, the reasons for the hunger strike or for the ceasefire being called was obviously for negotiations between the British and the IRA sent over this delegation. And one of the conditions was for the sit down was for the political status to be implemented in the, in the prisons. So the British relented to that. And as we know, the that particular ceasefire broke down in the Anadun, of all places, in, uh, in, in Belfast. And that led to more people going to jail. Uh, obviously, going, men and women going to jail, not only, not only in, in the north, but obviously here in the, in the uh, 26 counties and in Britain. So, everyone who was captured and was, uh, who was sentenced, whether it be Republican or Loyalist, automatically was given political status. Now obviously the British, the British never called it political status, it was a special, special category status, as, as they call it. And Romans, male, male, male Romans in Belfast and England were held in Cromwell Road Jail, and when they were sentenced, they were either sent to McGilligan, as I said, County Derry, or Long Cash, in just a, about 10 miles from Belfast, in the cages. But for any of you who have read Bobby Sands' book, and have read, uh, Ratings by other people who were in, in the cages at that, at that particular time. And if any of you have ever seen, or if you've been to, to visit Long Cash or been up in recent years since it's been closed down to see how close the cages were actually were to the, the H blocks. And there's people there who had a wee bit more 
awareness at that time were saying that this, this wall being built. Uh, and I wasn't in prison at this stage. I mean, I was fairly naive about the prison issues. Again, I had another sister was in at this time as well. So I was aware of what, what the prison conditions were now I'm at. I visited some men in the cages in, uh, in Long Cash. Nobody ever talked about the fact that uh, political status was going to be taken away. But it didn't come as a complete shock to everyone. As we know, the British uh, were implementing different policies on normalisation, criminalisation and ulcerisation, and that was to normalise the whole six counties, which I would argue is what they've achieved today in, 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 the, in the six counties. But at that time, when the IRA, or sorry, the British Army were at the forefront, the very few cops, RUC people, were coming in on patrols in, in the right of the Nanadoon, and I uh, wrote around about Belfast, but it was, it was mainly staying in Nanadoon and around Officers Town. You've very rarely seen cops. Maybe they come in with, when the Brits were coming in with their hand out summonses, or somebody's house was burgled, or their car was stolen, some crime. Although it was very little of it in the public areas, uh, given that the IRA were very strong that anybody stepped out of the line or kneecapped or never pardoned fell out or, or in the worst case, unfortunately some people were, were shot dead. Unfortunately for them, of course. Uh, so this, in, in, uh, coming up to 1975, the end of 1975, there was a ceasefire, it was called by the IRA. And it was a very famous, I can't remember the exact quote, but Marta Drum, when she was coming from a meeting in Dublin, driving from uh, Newry to, uh, to Belfast, she didn't see one British soldier, and she made this big Sinn Féin and the IRA made this big play that the British Army had pulled back the barracks, and that was one of the conditions for that particular ceasefire. The, uh, the British government, or Sinn Féin, set up uh, incident centres which were financed by the British government, and again, looking back at now, you can just see exactly what they were at. And it was, it was in our interest to set up these incident centres so that the, the IRA and the lesser extent Sinn Féin could police their areas. And, uh, but unfortunately, at that time, uh, there was a lot of sectarian attacks, mainly carried by, by loyalists, and Republicans did react, and again, it's not a, an indictment on, on the, on the pre period reserve. I would argue that in some cases, Republicans, and I don't think the IRA ever came killing any uh, loyalists, or definitely any Protestants, uh, intentionally. But whatever that groups were set up, there was probably cases in which they had no other option but to go out and take action against uh, loyalists. But unfortunately, sometimes they killed uh, ordinary Protestants in the midst of this here. So that all played into the hands, maybe inadvertently, maybe unintentionally, on the part of, of people who are in the IRA, but it played into the hands of the British, whereby they were able to turn around and say that they were involved in uh, gangsterism, drive by shootings. Uh, they used all these terminologies from old uh, 1920s, 30s gangster films like in Chicago, drive by shootings, uh, Godfathers, and all that, all that terminology which became, not in the city of Republicans, but it was used a lot uh, in the likes of the Irish News, probably the Irish Times, the Irish press of, of the day. And we can actually still see it being used today by people in Sinn Féin who should have known better referring to Republican groups. But they're using the same terminology which was used against uh, people in the IRA, and the IRA in general at that time. But, uh, this alterization, this criminalization uh, policy was implemented to defeat the IRA primarily. The INLA, with all due respect, and they were a smaller organization, they didn't have the same structures as what the IRA had, didn't have the same resources, didn't have the same uh, amount of uh, personnel. So it was mainly focused against the IRA. And the interrogation centers at this particular time, uh, especially Castlereagh and Belfast and Strand Road and Derry, were synonymous with torture. Now, everything was relative. It wasn't like Abu Ghraib or these torture centers which, which the Yanks and the Brits are using uh, around, around the world, waterboarding people, cutting fingernails right, and literally torturing people to death. But there's a lot of fear on, on people's part <coughs> about this particular time. And I remember when people, in, and the IRA structure at that, that time for any of you want the war was based on, on this, the old uh, structures of, around conventional army structures like companies, battalion, brigade, and then command, and then uh, GHQ and what have you. Although at that time, I'd say, and I've talked to a lot of people since then, very few volunteers on the ground knew the workings of the IRA, except that you're in a company or if you're in a battalion staff, you, you knew about a bit more. 
So, uh, men and women will uh, lift it, brought it to uh, Castle Ray in the company that I was in, or not, you know, the, the company I belong to, it was the F Company, and they were based, there was about six or seven companies in the 1st Battalion of the RA, that's where we were based in Belfast, and that was mainly uh, from St. James's right up as far as Trimberg and, and West Belfast, but we were F Company. There was a certain amount of competition, it's all a bit childish in some ways, you know, like, we have to go and do a better job in the company done or a company done or whatever the case may be. And there was a bit of competition, but it was nothing, I mean, there was a seriousness to it. But when we were here and people were being lifted and maybe getting released from Castle Ray, they were telling us about the horror <coughs> stories. And for somebody like myself, who, uh, and to be perfectly honest, I was a wee bit of a lottery bastard when I was a young, frothing, a young fella. And uh, like a lot of people, we went rat and then couldn't wait to go out and have a rat with the Brits and whatever else you were asked to do. And we went to camps and, and such like. So, like a lot of people, I was taken into uh, the worst that ever happened to me was Springfield Road Barracks, and that, that, that was synonymous with uh, beatings. But you only could only be held there for, for four hours. The British government could only, or the British Army could only hold you for four hours. It used to be a trolling exercise to get informers and put, put people under pressure and, and all that sort of thing. So, uh, I was run about, thought it was. Not check a ladder and like this here, but you know, I was running about in a, in a company which maybe had about 20 volunteers, me and I'm in them. And it was a fairly, fairly good company, there was uh, sound people in it, and people I became very thick with, very friendly with, up in Forest State until recent times, as things happened, but we'll talk about that later on. So, this, I, again, I, as I said, I've been left at Mother Brook, we brought to Fort Mona, it was a, a barracks, which is a, a where Art Mona is now in Turf Lodge, and a lot of times you would have got slapped about. I never got ever got a real bad beating by the British Army, except once. Myself and a friend were walking up. This is during the feud between the sticks and the Europe's. And the IRA was in the ceasefire. And we would have been known as red lights even then, even though we were young, actually 18 to 10, 17 or 18. And uh, myself and a friend were walking up Namdoon Avenue. It was, it was about 11 o'clock at night. And the British jumped out of the chiefs and started messing us about. Next thing we heard is fucking rattling, all this shooting. We looked at each other, two of us were in a rat, we knew it was a rat on it. So the Brits got stuck in the US, threw us in their car, and we were right from ended up with sticks and the Europe's were fired, had a, a bit of a gun battle, firing it away. Obviously, we didn't over it. So that was the worst for me ever getting, I mean, not ever, but that was the worst for me at that time, getting a beating from the Brits and uh, then it was taken at uh, Fort Mona. And this particular morning, on the 27th of July, 1976, the uh, door was knocked. Uh, our house, like, wouldn't have been rated too often, but it would have been rated 40. Fairly often, and uh, Brits and Peter, or Peter's want to come in and raid the house and what have you. And I, uh, my dad came up and says, uh, "They're lifting you." And I went, "Right, right, this sort of thing." So I heard my dad. This is about say half five, six o'clock in the morning. I just get my shoes on, get my clothes on, and say, "Hey, this is easy, or easy time in uh, Fort Mona." And I heard my dad saying, "So where, where are they phone at Fort Mona?" He says, "No, we're bringing them to Castle Ray." <laughs> this is says a wildy bastard. And I went. My dad came up with stars. My mom was there at that time. I said, two sisters and two young. There was eight of us in the house, nine of us in the house that time. And uh, uh, three, three brothers there were uh, still, four were slept in the, in the one room. And uh, our name, uh, he, he ended up doing time in England. You know, take me to Cassare. He's an evil young, evil 11 or 12. Will you be all right? And I just called myself, I hope I'm all right. So the next day I came downstairs, there was two CID men, you know, everybody dressed in civilian clothes was a cop, was a branch man, but we didn't understand the workings of it, what are you seeing at that time? And I'd say, the same a lot of people in the CS staff here didn't understand fully what, uh, how the dispatch of branch and CID and cards and all worked at, at that time either. So, in the Jeep, we had a castle ray, and the first interrogation I got, this isn't too bad, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to get. So I started questioning about uh, thing. With the IRA, you're in the IRA and all that sort of business, and obviously the man in those days, you could talk uh, in the barracks. Obviously the man what they were into, but you could talk anyway, there was no thing on the, uh, the, the green boot, wasn't there at this particular time. Obviously there was, there was lads that I, I knew were real hard nuts, just, they hated, everybody hated cops. And these men would never have spoken to cops, even if they were lifted for, for anything. So a couple of days, as the day wore on, Started to get a wee bit harder, slapping the boot, made to stand up, sit down on the floor and all that sort of thing. At that time, he'd done it more than the later years, he just wanted to do all these sort of things. But, uh, we tried not to do it anyway. So, after three days, I admitted, uh, 
to hijack the car for the IRA, and I wasn't done my membership. So I sent a statement that uh, my eternal shame was brought to criminal jail. Now, when we were brought into criminal jail, obviously I knew that we didn't have political status, but by own a man, you wore your own clothes. And that's, you know, it was a big wake up call for a lot of us. But apart from whenever we were uh, shortly, well, we used to get the odd briefing in uh, our own company by the company OC. And we were told that, uh, but nobody took it too seriously. Like, see, if you're lifted here, lads, you're not, you know, well, that's men and women, like, if you're lifted, you're not going to get political status here. You know, you're, we, did, we didn't actually know what was going to happen. We just knew, you so, and that's so bad. We weren't being blasé ever. So, taking them to criminal jail, at that stage, it was, uh, it was a lot more men were going through the, the, the jail, more men were coming in after myself, and, uh, and the place was getting packed. We didn't really know what we were going to be doing. We talk, had meetings, obviously, in the yard, prison yard, and meetings in the canteens, and obviously talking about ourselves. What are we going to do when we get sentenced? What's, what's the form of protest we're going to be taking? Now, also at this particular time, I know that I've done this, talk to people, you know, students coming from other parts of the world, and people that ask questions and all, you know, you never grow up in the and all this sort of thing. But then, right, we left this. And at that, that, that time, I was a practicing Catholic. For all that, I didn't really understand it. But this is the first time that I actually met Protestants, real Protestants. Like, it was, when I was a child, I was in the hospital, and I'm sure it was Protestant kids in the hospital. But they were loyalists, and any time you'd leave your, you'd leave your cell, you had to get stuck in the loyalists, and they were told the same thing. So as soon as the door opened, you had to go on a visit, legal visit, or a uh, family visit. And you saw the loyalists, you had to get stuck in them. And some of them was half-hearted, because you didn't know that he was going to be there. But we knew we wanted segregation, that was, that was the bottom line. And the, the way it worked in the criminal jail, you had uh, what we refer to as good days, bad days. Now, and prison at that particular time was a bit of an adventure. We were all, I was really a team and fellas you knew, uh, you had no work people from other parts of the, uh, especially in the north, a bit of crack and all that sort of business. But the good day was that you got out in the morning, uh, say between 10 o'clock and half 11, the yard, then uh, the, between, say, 6 and 7 o'clock. The bad day was you got out in the afternoon, and so it, I'll turn up, alternate between our sales and uh, loyalists. And the very, there was no contact, as, at least as far, as far as I was aware, at that particular time between uh, the, the staff in the jail and loyalist uh, their staff. So we went through the motions and all this sort of crack, and uh, we're all talking about what are we going to do when we're sentenced. So the first person to be sentenced on first or second of September, the start of September anyway. Was Keir Nugent. Now, Keir Nugent? I didn't know. I didn't know Keir Nugent. He was in the word seeming. I was in the wing in the jail. And the only time you would have met men from that other wing was we were going to court. We used to go to court uh, once a week, and uh, in the prison vans or horse boxes, as we call them, down at Hall Street, maybe about a mile, less than a mile away. And then the, the main court across in Crumlin Road Court, you had to in the tunnel, under a tunnel, and up the court itself. So Keir Nugent, he was sentenced to three years. And because the criminal no jail was starting to fill up, there was three of us there sale, and uh, the same size of sales as you see in, I presume most of you have been in Palmyrin jail, or if any of you have ever been in the uh, Bryce Victorian jail, three days sale. So uh, we started then moving us, anybody who got your, once you got your, your depositions or your papers, court papers, what's the word from the uh, What's that? Book of evidence. Book of evidence. Once you got your book of evidence, or your Depositions, we referred them up there. We were brought, uh, we were brought down the hate blacks, and we were brought in the hate one. And that was the first time that I'd obviously seen the hate blacks. We were heard about. At that time, there was about ten or twelve men all together on the blanket protest, and you had Lisa Finbar McKenna and uh, a member of North fellow called James Connolly Bradley. He or Bradley, James Con TCB, James Connolly uh, Bradley. He was North from Derry. And the first Sunday when we went to Mass, now we, again, we us wore our, our clothes and the regime in the haste flaps was a lot easier than it was in the criminal jail. Even though the criminal jail wasn't particularly hard, it was better food, I thought, in the, in the blacks. We went into the thing, uh, in the canteen for Mass, and these lads came in wearing a blanket and they were starting to work, uh, grow a beard and what have you. And the crew, they weren't talking to each other, couldn't even talk to us. Now we tried to smuggle them over tobacco or uh, Sweets like pulamins or something like this here, the screws were standing. You were able to get it done, done already. And then the priest, there was a priest called uh, Cahill, who was, as a surname, he was a dead, as far as priests are concerned, he was dead on. I remember one mass, he actually stopped the mass 
wanted to see the, the PO of the black because one of the, the man James County really got a broken arm from the screw within the gate of Crappenham. Now it wasn't good for us knowing that we were seeing these men coming in, some of the black eyes, and they were telling us these horror stories. And we were all, most of us knew we were going to, we were going to be sentenced within, within months. So these men were coming in uh, the mass every Sunday, and the same mass when we were going to. We were up and we were talking after, and oh, Jesus, see, trust and trust the black air, fucking no matter what black air going to end up in. Well, there's only three blacks you put them in, If you went to 21, you went to H2. So in January 1977, I was sentenced to three years and moved down from criminal jail. But before I got down, I had sort of stay. <coughs> I was, I had long hair, not, not, not down on my shoulder, but long hair. But the screws made the uh, orderlies come in and cut, shave their head. I'd shave the, the, the bone, even like the length of his now. And uh, he went down and seen the, this uh, governor, who told him you know, one of his blacks. Now he's only got, I'd done, so that was just less than six months I'd done. He said, like, if you keep your nose clean, all that sort of thing, you'd be out in a year. I think to myself, definitely be out in a year. The blanket protest isn't going to last. I'd be out long before the blanket protest is over. And that's, we were all, we were all saying, like, for whatever reason it was, uh, March was a big date. That's when political status was going up. There's all these rumours we were, we were here, and probably all wanted to like, hear all this sort of stuff. So, we turned to the, the blacks, uh, his blacks, it was, it was a really cold day. It was the 5th of January 1977. And again, I was the first one sentenced after the winter recess. And the screw came into reception and says, uh, uh, What size of brooch do you take and the size of your, your waist? Believe it or not, I was very skinny then. Yeah, I was, I was uh, even a bit smaller now, uh, then than I am now. And I says, No, I'm, uh, I'm going on the, I'm not wearing a prison uniform. The screw started laughing, slammed the door, and says, There's no fucking one. And I was only, it was, it was a bit of a recess because nobody had been sentenced for about two or three weeks over the Christmas period. And it was this loyalist who said he was going on the blanket as well. And there was one or two loyalists in this, on the blanket as well. And I was going to hope he, because he was on the 21 as well. We were called YPs, Young Prisoners, and I knew it was going to H2. So your man came down, we were brought in the same van. The screws weren't giving us any hassle this day, except to say, we carry a uh, uniform down with your boots, brand new. Bre we, monkey suits, we call them, uh, prison uniform, and a, a pair of boots, and a pair of socks, and underwear. And you were brought down the, I was brought the H2, and brought into the reception, it was called reception. And the haste blacks, he was. If you haven't already been there and visited, or you've seen the, the, the bar of the H, that was what was known as the circle. And uh, we brought in, and uh, this say, I can't remember this guy's name, but say you call him Jimmy Jones or something. Which one's Jones? He says, Me, this wee screw is a PO, wee bastard. They come over and he's give you a man a big slap in the face. Put that uniform on. So you want to take his clothes off and put the uniform on? And I have a stand, I swear. I, um, it was the most terrifying day of my life. And even when I look back on it, it was really. Th so I was standing there, shivering with the cold, shivering with the fear. I think, oh, right, Cotter, put that new. I'm not putting it on. Put that new. This wee bastard started stopping me about all these screws, man. I right, nice size, nice standing around me. Well, oh, shouting the ground. Put that uniform on. Put the uniform on. I'm not putting it on. <laughs> Leave me alone. You know, doesn't work again. So. It made me take my uh, clothes off and I was down there bowing me get freezing. It was fucking uh, fear. And at that time I was a practicing Catholic and Catholic and I had a, a Catholic cross around my neck. He says, uh, this wee, uh, forget his name, his name will me. But he says, uh, take that effing thing off. And I went, and I was, because of the fear and the cold, I couldn't get the thing, so he ripped it off me. And he started punching me and I was going, why is this going to stop? And it seemed like he just probably was only a minute or two. So, See this big fat bastard of the screw says, bring him down to the cell and make and you're gonna put that uniform on tomorrow. So the place was saying, this place was really saying. I went down to the, the cell, and the screw literally threw me into the cell, and I thought, oh, man, jeez, for another two and a half years this, maybe. So anyway, after about 10 or 15 minutes, and that came to the, uh, the wall, I found a pipe, there was pipes running along the back of the, the cell. What voice whispered and says, What's your name? And I says, Pop and Cotter. And he says, Right, I fucking bollocks. It's freezing here. What I do? And he says, Lift one of the blankets and wrap it around you. So that was the start of, for me, the blanket protest. And I says, uh, What's a crack? He says, I can't talk. I can't talk. I have to wait until the night. So I just sitting there going, The next thing the screws come down and says, Right, out for your dinner. You had to, anything you needed to say, you had to leave Bollock naked. Well, you go to the reception to get your, your grub. 
So from then, that was for me. That was a very, very hard time. The screws would come in uh, at different times. Come in. That, again, not getting a bad beating, but it was a, the fear was or the fear of it was worse than actual physical beating. Because I remember one day, was, the fellow next door to me is from Derry. He was a smoker, and I, I my last cigarette was uh, partly Lotus came in on the way down the blast. I actually smoked twenty of these partly unfiltered cigarettes on the way down in the van. Right, and that was my last cigarette. So this fella was a uh, this this Lordis was a Nord Lordis orderly. He would have thrown cigarettes in the case needed uh, the lads who smoked, or when we were out of the sale, he would have thrown a Mars bar or something on the your pillow or threw it in your sale. So this particular day, the, I heard a screw saying, "Where's my car?" That's, that's the way the screw spoke. Call this fucker Jack Todd. Never forget. Oh, never forget him. Really. Jack Todd. And he says. Uh, and there's obviously something about this man, apart from being a bastard. He says, uh, Grab your blanket. That's the way he should talk. And you had a blanket, stop the thing, and he said, Big slap in the face, and he looked up there. And, and he says, uh, What are you doing smoking, you bastard? And I says, I don't smoke. I knew he was a man next door. I was going to say I was fucking him next door. And he says, Come here, here. Grab me by this thing. He says, See, I watched her up there. I was there last night and I saw you smoking. I counted the sales down. They started beating the fuck out of me. So, he was a, a sort of a scum in the earth. But anyway, uh, we weren't too sure about, none of us were taking visits, weren't too sure about what was happening in the outside. We didn't know what was happening in regards to political status. We knew it wasn't happening sooner. We thought it was going to happen sooner than what it was. More and more we were coming on the blanket. So in, in April of that year, we were all moved to H, H5. And the morale rose. Absolutely brilliant. We're all uh, doubled up in the cell. And we're all in the one block. And uh, Tom McFeely, he was on. He ended up going the first hunger strike from Kirkby Gary. He was the first OC. And the screws were getting us little or no hassle. We were getting more food. Now you're talking about you're 19. I hate like the food now, but then you're you're growing. Your body and all's growing. And you wanted uh, as much as you can eat. And the food was hot. There was little or no hassle. We started learning. Uh, Started learning songs, started learning Irish language, started learning poetry. Like, you know, man, there's nobody taking visits at this day. We're at ourselves 24 hours a day. There's no TV, no radio, no, no newspapers. The only, only reading material we had was a Bible or uh, for any of you old Catholics here, some Martin the Poor's magazines or all these things. And that's when I started to question the whole thing about religion and started, I mean, we have these debates. And I suppose even then there was a bit of a contrary person. But, uh, oh, believe it or not, I was in those days. So we all went to Mass once a week and we all went in and, and the people, the fewer men were actually going to Mass, they just used to stand in the corner and you end up, uh, maybe somebody got a letter sent in, you got one letter a month. Protest, as I say, was, was escalating. Then about, it started in 19, the end of 1977, it started in 1978, Darby Hughes came onto, onto the, the black, our black, and he, he, he got done for beating the screw up in the cages, him and uh, four or five others, and they, were, they lost their status and they ended up in the blacks. So the dark, everybody in Belfast, I mean, they've heard of Darby Hughes, you know, he's a bit of a living legend. And when you're young, you're, you look up at people and all that sort of thing. And we couldn't get into the mass, that's what you see, the dark, it's like, oh, the dark, the dark, you know, and all this. Went to the mass and saw the dark, and the dark, there was a dark, you know, the, the beard, he grew a beard about a week, you know, when he's uh, uh, was standing there. So he put a statement around the, around the blacks, uh, this black, and anyway, there was two blacks at this stage, his five and his four. And this is the first time I ever heard the term on a pig's back. We were on a pig's back, and our morale rose sky high. We're going to win the dark, it's going to bring us to this. That's a way of war, you know, we just, we just wanted this, this savior, or, and this savior happened to be Brent Hughes, the dark. So morale was very high, obviously a screw sword morale, amazing. Uh, getting higher, we, uh, uh, they were concerned about this year because more and more men were coming on the blanket. The uh, people in the Crumber Road jail, men were on the man, were told that the more numbers we have, <coughs> the British won't be able to maintain this and sustain this protest. That the more men want it, the, 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 the quicker we'll get our status. And you, so it was okay. Then, uh, and I mean, the boards that took, even though you're in solitary confinement, there was a board, a, a punishment block down close to the cages. And I ended up in a bit of a, an argument with a screw. I was out 
the screws occasionally want to let you out. Uh, if your piss pack is full up, they want to let you out, slap it out, slap out. There's no toilets in the cells, of course. And uh, I came down and I screamed, I was standing on top, and they said, well, and uh, he was going to see anything. I used to pass the message on down, and this screw started slapping. I mean, I started slapping back, so it brought me the boards. And at that time on the boards, you were on what was known as number one dad. You got uh, four rounds of bread, a cup of black tea in the morning, a uh, bowl of soup, vegetable soup, and a potato or two for your dinner. And then the same as you got for your breakfast that morning. So you're on this for three days. And, and unknown to me, that the camp staff or the jail staff at that time had, had said that they were going to start a uh, no wash protest. So I came back on the back of the boards on the Saturday and I was in the cell with a fellow called Paul McDenzie from uh, Balaki. We were in the cell for about 18 months and uh, he says we're starting a no wash protest here on, on, on the Monday. I says, what's this going for? And so then we were all told that right, lads, we're not washing, that's it. Stop washing and we're not asked, uh, we can still slap out. So not a no wash protest and uh, the screws then started beating men and we were lucky, we were relatively lucky in H5, it just wasn't as bad as H3, the end opened in H4, H3 was probably one of the worst. There was a screw, screw there called uh, uh, Kerr, who the IRA ended up killed in 1883 in Armagh City, scumbag. Of, and I was, we'd all heard of this, this camp and the P over the black wheel was a man called Lavin, he was from Armagh City as well. But he was a tag and he wasn't actually too bad. In fact, one of his brothers was, or a relative of his, his was in Port Lisa Jail at the time, but his brother, his cousin, really. So, even though it was the odd beating that's happened, uh, screws messing people about, whenever we got out once a week for a shower and slapping out, the screws would have tried to mess people about. So, we'll set it down to stop slapping out. So, what we've done is we uh, smashed out all our furniture. Smashed our windows and, and uh, the windows you were able to stand, it wasn't like a Victorian TLD, you stand with your elbows and, and, the, and the, 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 the TL bar, uh, cell bars, and look out, you know, so it was at eye level. We smashed our windows and because uh, the screws were coming around with disinfectant, really wrong, strong disinfectant. So we uh, decided then that we'd only pour a piss out the window at night and when the screws were coming around, at, at, uh, Shortly before lap up, we were lap up all the time, but these even maybe use these terms as well. Lap up, free glass and ice and all that sort of thing. And uh, the screws come around and they would have come around with a bin and it was saying it was 26 sales, 24 sales with two men in sales, so that's 48, maybe 50 men in a wing. All this smelly piss, a day's piss being thrown in their bin, they would have come around and kicked sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes kicked in the sunny sale. Imagine the smell this here, shit and pissing in a, in a, in a um, bin. So we then decided to uh, not stop out, and uh, that's when we started spreading our shit in the wall. And that was a really hard time. That, uh, besides the fact, you know, you're, you're, you're in a cell with somebody, and uh, you have to go in the corner and have a shit, and then as soon as you do it, you're over in the wall. And I remember the first, I remember this fella, Paul McKenzie, I remember he was having shit out of the window, I went down the pit and called the fella next door to you. Fuck. <laughs> so I was up, most of the cell was covered, the, the walls were covered in shit, and the bit of ceiling needed covered. It's almost like you're painting the wall. So I was up with the thing, and I dropped a lump of shit on <laughs> his shoulder, and it was bad enough, you know, holding a pan in your own shit. Fuck, when the air came to blows. Now, that's the worst argument the two of us ever had. He thought I'd done on purpose, but it didn't. <laughs> And then, you know, you think of, you know, you're just thinking about this, uh, the way it's been on. So, then you, you saw a man coming down from the, uh, the crumb, meeting men at mass, and you're seeing a boat man, or her was going, at that time I didn't see him, with a bit of bum fluff and, and the chin and a bit of moustache. And, uh, but all the men there were, their beers were going, they were going down there, fucking no time, you know, I was going, I wish I could grow up here, but you know, if you could grow up here, you would, you weren't able to wash. You wouldn't want to appear like that. And we're also uh, in the summer because of the, the, the rubbish in the corner. And you couldn't eat every single thing. You couldn't eat eggshells. You couldn't eat uh, meat bones and uh, chicken bones or whatever. So they were attracting flies, and the, the flies were then breeding and maggots. And because of we were laying on a sponge on, on the cell floor, just with a blanket over you, and there was no pelican, no sheets, and I like this here. The maggots were being attracted to your body, and uh, you wake up in the morning and you're a plant body, and you're getting your 
Magnets are there, there could be cars, and all this sort of thing. Oh, fuck, I'm gonna stick this. You know, for me, that's only meant them to annoy. Even today, I get, like fishermen and all that, but we'll, we'll annoy. And then in the, in the winter, in the, the, in the winter of 78, it was a well known term, everybody talks about the winter of 78, and it's said to be the, winter, the coldest winter in the history, one of the coldest winters in the history of the whole of Ireland, and that particular part of uh, uh, the north, that particular part of Ireland, in fact, it's one of the coldest parts in the whole of, 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 whole of Ireland. Uh, it's in a bit of a valley, and I'm 17 degrees, now whether it's true or not, I don't know, but We've heard all this, and people were writing letters in. And it was propaganda about about the conditions and all that were held under. And uh, so the only way in which we could really keep warm our windows were out. We had two piss pots, and the piss pot just about uh, if you put it at uh, an angle or sideways, it would have with a bit of blanket would have been enough to the way it's a blanket in, kept some heat out. So you had the now you weren't down side each other. You know, it was, I don't know, too close. You land probably negative. We said we were all young men, but we were. Uh, uh, several things, so we kept some heat in, so every morning the screws would have come in and pulled the blanket out. And you would have seen the snow, if it had been snowing or frost, coming in. The blankets were stiff, uh, that cold. Water gallons were frozen the next morning, it was that cold in the cell. And uh, then, to make matters worse, was uh, wind shifts. Because of what we were spreading a shit in the wall, the administration were concerned, it was a PR thing on their part, they were concerned, they were saying there was a possibility of disease spread. And so they decided in their wisdom to move one wing out to an, spread an, an hour block in the H3. So the four, the four, three, H3, three, four, and five, there's three wings in each block. And this one wing was kept clean. They would have brought industrial cleaners in the screws themselves. What are they going to pay for this here? And these screws were getting massive money. They were getting all sorts of grants, getting protection money. Because the IRA at that time were killing screws. But uh, and on reflection, that the were aware of all this sort of thing and talking to men who were out at the time. If the IRA had better intelligence at that particular time, uh, which is the other key and uh, hitting specific targets like governors and chiefs, POs, people who were pushing policy, prison policy, uh, that may have had a different effect on the protest, possibly even on the hunger strike itself. But they didn't have it, they were killing the old screw, mainly from the crumb because it was easier for the IRA to go up the crumb and jail. And killed screws, and it was to drive out the wrong case, was 10 miles away, getting you know, run back and all that sort of things. So, whenever screws were, were killed, the screws themselves what it became more uh, violent against us. And then the worst time was when we were getting the wing shift. You were getting moved maybe from uh, through the circle, from say from A, B, C, or D, whatever, but you say you were an A wing, you were getting moved over to D wing, which was the clean wing, maybe seven o'clock in the morning, half seven in the morning, freezing. All you have is a, a small towel around you. You moved over the uh, screws, uh, say a table like this here, you totally bend over the table. You didn't do it. And uh, there were some men there, like the, uh, the black guy I was in, and talking about real hard nuts. Just real hard name, not that hard name, Bully West, but just really hard nothing like Joe McDonald and Pat Livingstone and, and a couple of lads in our wing. Uh, Kate Heather Nugent, Kieran Nugent was a real hard, he was a real hard man. And they were, they had got the beatings to get down, other ones that bladder like myself and you didn't have to push me too far, too hard to get down. But you would have put over the mirror and the screws would have had, uh, and you think about now, nah, part, of, part of discussion it is, you know, and you're not pretty easy about it, but that's the way it was. They would have opened your cheeks when you haven't, and you haven't washed for months, and then the same hands open your mouth and see if there's any calms or anything. And obviously, the way it means we were able to get some other things from, uh, say, uh, you would have had uh, calms, which needed to be kept. And you put them up your arse, that's uh, plain and simple as it was. So we all knew what way the, uh, you would have got the Republican uses smuggled in, and so Minterace, and they would have gold dust, anything that we could get to read, because you couldn't read anything. Bible, who wants to read the Bible, even if you're a fundamental Christian or something, I guess, here. And uh, so we had all these things. It was a very, very hard time, but I knew, and it was a bit of, not being selfish about this here, but I knew that I was getting it. And then, uh, just prior to I got out, uh, they all say that uh, Darty Who sent around word for everybody to go to war and talk, give their ideas about how the, the protest is going to be. Uh, Further, hearts are going to be expanded, and everybody in the family knew that the only, the obvious thing was a hunger strike. And it was very hard for me to say this. There was a couple of our, our lads in our wing who were 
doing maybe four or five years, and they were getting it short, relatively short. Like, uh, there was men who were doing life, men were doing maybe 15 years, 20 years, and they thought at this stage, because we realised this isn't going to end, but we thought it's going to end in a short space of time. We knew these men were going to be here for a long time. <coughs> it was very difficult for me to get up at the door. Everybody had to get up at the door, even men who were very quiet, the likes of Tap Power, never spoke at the door, Mickey Devine never spoke at the door. People like us here just, just they were quiet individuals. Men wouldn't go for sing songs, not that they were obviously social, I'm just that was the nature of people. But everybody had to get up and give it a spoke. Most men were, were reluctant to mention hunger strike. It was one of these unwritten, unsaved things. And I didn't say it, I just said, I don't know how the protest is going to be escalated. Uh, it's just, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I didn't mention hunger strike. Mm -hmm. I could have said it. But I knew there was men on our wing who were prepared to go on hunger strike. The real uh, <laughs> price was in my wing. And uh, so anyway, I got released. And shortly before I got released, the screw, uh, it was a bank holiday. Uh, I was getting released, and I, had, I hadn't taken any visits at all. And it was a bank holiday that I would have been released on. It was a bank holiday Monday in July. So there was a fellow from Derry called uh, Toots Carmen, he was the OC. And you weren't allowed to talk to school using this. You, you had to go to a dentist or something, like something real, a real emergency, you, know, you were really, really sick or something. And I says, and this particular screw wasn't a bad screw. And I said, he says, when are you getting released, Chopper? And I says, I don't know if it's Monday. Men are 20 years in life. I couldn't crab in two or three days. And he says, uh, I says, I don't know if it's a Friday here, because the 27th of July or 30th of July is a bank holiday. And that was a really release date. But somebody had said, You don't get released in bank holiday, jails are closed. So it's on, say, Wednesday. So he says, That's the screw, he's going to bail, screwing down. I says, When am I getting released? So you get released on Friday, he says, On Wednesday. And two or three days. That was a big thing to get released, that uh, thing. It was a very emotional time for me getting released, <coughs> knowing that this protest was, was escalating, knowing that <coughs> even at that stage I knew there was going to be a hunger strike. And so I got released, and uh, I was a bit of a culture shock. Even, even when, I look, when I look at a photograph of the day I got released, and I'd go on maybe an inch or two. Uh, in fact, I thought I could be more in that there because the Bibles, one of the, one of the lads in the next day to us was a bit of a wag, and he says, the Bibles were five and three quarter inches uh, in length, but the Bibles were five and a half inches, something like that. It was a, bit of a fraction of inches and thing. So he said to me, Chopper, uh, measure yourself. Because <laughs> I was getting married and I wanted, they were all curious as to know that when my clothes, they were going to be at a reception two and a half years prior to this year, we're still going to fit me because I couldn't get new clothes sent in. So I got these measures, you know, with a bit of toothpaste tube, and I draw dead seriousness. Maybe five, six foot. I thought I was six foot because of the way this was being measured. It wasn't, it was a five, ten and a half or something. So I said, Chopper, those clothes will never fit you. So I went down thinking, these clothes are never going to fit me. What how am I going to, I was that patty stuff I got there. How am I going to get out? But the, the night before it did get released, uh, I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, say, got voice from March 1978 until uh, July of 79, so that length of time. But they brought me down the boards. And the night before these screws come in, and there was four, a lot of men were getting forced voices, forced, forced baths, forced haircuts, and they were getting a bad experience as we didn't deck scrubbers and all that sort of thing. And the screws, a doctor would have come along with each cell, uh, and unfortunately, see any man had, say, a blue beard, her up to the hair, a big heavy beard, and long hair, the hair grew quick or something this year. They were the first, was they not the dirtiest? Really, a lot of us in our way, we were all look white peas, even that stage, and we're all like, Bum fluff and pimples, that was our worst uh, thing. Most of us, anyway. So the screws brought me down and uh, says, right, brought me to the cell and says, right, and the, the boards, bath in the bath. And even then, I go in, and then I'm going to have to protest right up to the very end. And he says, no, so I took the blanket off, sat on the, on the floor. I thought I was going to get a date with you. But then I said, I'm already going to beat me in the, in the last day and get it to tomorrow morning. So I brought me down, and I says, it's embarrassing, like screws bringing in, four or five screws, putting you into a hot bath, washing you, not with deck scrubbers, but, uh, what do you call them things? Anyway. A uh, loofah. What's that? A loofah. That's whatever, it didn't really matter. No, it is. We wash you around, wash you around your favorite person, all this sort of thing. And I hadn't seen myself in the mirror for 18 months or something. And I look in the mirror, and I go myself, I'm as bad as, look at as the lads used to see in the bath. Dan looking skinny, gaunt long hair, 
anyway, I got out the next day and uh, whatever, and a couple of days later, so at that time, you know, it was, it was like a lot of people were gone, reported back to the IRA, and uh, went back. And when I was going, when I was going around, I started getting involved in the anti hate black campaign. I got a wee bit pissed off it because it's just the way I was going. And uh, a lot of people were uh, saying about the hunger strike going to start. And it was clear it was going to be a hunger strike. And so as we know, the hunger strike started in October of 1980, seven days ago. And uh, led by the dark. And then after 18 days, three women went up, started an RMA. Then finished after 53 days in December. The British, now nobody knows for sure, and this is still being debated today as to what was in the, the document that they were going to bring and show the dark. And I would never, ever, and this is my own personal opinion, I know mean, that uh, some people were critical of the dark. I would never, ever criticize them. Like for calling that hunger strike off, we can, we can criticise the tactics that we used at that time. I know it's a terrible thing to talk about men's lives. Sean McKenna was down. He felt that Sean McKenna was moving to an outside hospital. The dark felt that if he continued a hunger strike, Sean McKenna was definitely going to die. And there's all sorts of rumours going around. And I'm even hearing these today and all this sort of thing about the, the six men who were kept in the Hays Block hospital, prison hospital in the Hays Blocks. They got together and there was consensus. I don't know, some people said it was actually a vote. And you're going to have different opinions in this here. I wasn't there. I have never asked anybody. And I got to know Leo Green and Liam McCartney very well after that, when I'm back at the game in the, in the, in the 19, later 1980s. I would never have asked them because they would have put these men on the spot. And, uh, but some people were saying there was a vote taken or there was consensus taken as to whether the hunger strike should be called off. Well, it was called off anyway, before any of them read this document. 30 pages, 20 pages, I don't know what, many pages are in this document. And it didn't succeed. Now, what I do know, talking to people, there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, and I realise I'm talking too long here, but there's anecdotal stuff about uh, when Bobby Sands, if Bobby Sands had taken on the role of OC uh, after, at, the, at this time, once the dark went on hunger strike, but the dark was in charge of the hunger strike itself. He went up to see the, the lads in the hospital, told them what, why they called the hunger strike off. Now, as far as I'm aware, Bobby Sands only told one or two people exactly what was said. And these men may bring their, their, their grave with them. I don't know if they'd use it for political reasons in the other time, to, to, make it, to score political points or whatever. And we all know how cynical politics are, or cynical people are, or, or whatever. But what I do know is that people were saying when they saw Bobby Sands, it says the only time they saw this man crying, he was walking down the river outside of the door, and they saw Bobby Sands walking down, coming into the block, and walking down the particular cell, and he was actually crying. And crying, whether, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe it was through frustration. He wanted to go on hunger strike two days later. Other people said, now, he wasn't a volatile person, and I, as I said, I didn't know the man well, I just knew he said, oh, he was the same black as us, but I seen him pass, and didn't see him as any, uh, you know, any more special than anybody else, but he always stood out, I mean, because of the poetry and all that sort of thing, a very good singer, and a bit of a charismatic character, but a bit of a character as well. But, anyway, as we do know, the hunger strike started on the 1st of March, on the 5th, 5th anniversary of the political status taken away in 1981. Ten men died, but the most contentious issue of that particular period, and uh, when Richard Law brought in about about five or six years ago, uh, claiming that uh, the IRA leadership of the IRA had said, led by Jerry Adams and, and Danny Morrison, and, and his critical was two in particular, saying that there could have been an end of the protest, and he and Bert McFarlane had been discussing this here, that there was something before Joe McDonald, just right before Joe McDonald died, obviously he died in the 8th of July, he was the fifth hunger striker that died, four have already died. And I've talked, and this is this is what I've been saying, I've spoken to him, there's a man called uh, George Clark, Cle George Cleaky Clark, he claims in a, in, a, in a place in Derry that he heard a conversation taking place between Bickman Farland, or sorry, yes, Bickman Farland and Mr. Law, 
This or raw was in one cell, Big McFarland was two cells down. Now you could talk, and not in a whisper, you could talk even lower than when I'm talking now. And anybody in this, uh, maybe three or four cells could hear that conversation taking place. So I spoke to a fellow who's in cell with T.P. Clark when he claims to have heard this here. And I said, I, up until I spoke to this fellow last year, I thought that Katie Clark was on the same side of the black, the same side of the wind, sorry, as Katie Clark, or as <coughs> Rick McFarland, or Mr. Raw. And he said, no, he was on the opposite side of the wind. And I'm on the opposite side. It'd be sure hard to have heard, unless they were shouting at the top of their voices, they wouldn't have heard the conversation. Not only that, there are Rick and Mr. Raw were speaking in Irish, and Katie Clark at that time, a lot of men are, 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 are Irish, and I spoke about this up in Belfast. Some men who learned Irish, something to be, be nosy because of, you know, I want to hear what's going on and, and whatever. But there's a lot of men who learned Irish for you know, the right reasons and, and uh, political reasons. And Cleaky Clark didn't have enough Irish to understand what was being said between Rick and Richard Raw. Now, the key the point that I, I've made uh, before to people, I don't know if there was a deal done. Uh, if there was something, the Hunger Strike could have been called off at that particular time. Could the leadership of the IRA have called off the Hunger Strike? Would the, the prisoners in the jail allow the leadership of the IRA to call the Hunger Strike off? Having four men on right day, numerous amount of men who were prepared to go on Hunger Strike, this Hunger Strike was going to go on for how long, nobody knows. Prepared to go on for how long, nobody knows. And, uh, <coughs> but I, ultimately, no matter if there was a deal done, Again, I don't know, and, and I'm, I'm skeptical of and it's my personal opinion on this here. I'm skeptical of Richard Raw and his motives for writing this here, uh, and why I brought up at that particular time. He's a, he's a valid argument. I wouldn't say that he hasn't got a valid argument in what he's saying. But uh, ultimately, the Brits were responsible for this here. The SDLP sat back and done nothing. Catholic Church sat back and done nothing. Claimed they've been doing things. Cardinal O'Fee, who was supposed to be a friend of the prisoners, after he'd done that, he may have given a few uh, lectures to Mark Maggie Thatcher when they met each other. I'm not saying the SDLP and the Catholic Church, even if they had a committee to support the prisoners, they would have uh, ended the Hunger Strike. We all know the Thatcher, given her, her herself, never mind her, her particular government, and the others. Now, I was starting to hear about elements within the, the, the NIO, where they, where they published things. It's all this speculation. Now the truth will come out someday about it all. Of course it will come out someday about it all. I may never hear it. People in this room may never hear it. It may be written somewhere by the great and the good, hidden in some fucking Duncan carry or something, to be uh, put out sometime in the future. Or something like Boston College may have something put there in the event of something happening. But all we can deal on, all we can deal with as it stands today, we know for a fact that 10 men died. We know for a fact that the British government allowed 10 men to die. We know for a fact that they tried to uh, defeat the IRA principally. Obviously, the, the IRA was in that mix as well. And unfortunately, when I know, the Brits unfortunately did defeat the IRA. But at, then when we look at what happened since the Hunger Strike ended, within a matter of uh, months, the, 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 the campaign, the five, the five, the, the five, uh, Demands the prisoners were, were campaigning for were gained within a very short space of time. And then in September 1983, three men escaped from Long Case, or sorry, 38 men escaped from Long Case. And uh, uh, conditions that I went back down to in 1986, I could not believe what we got within a, a, a very short space of time after this uh, 10 men van for what we achieved. That's in a jail context. Obviously, Talk too long, they're probably going to argue. Uh, there's a lot of things happening outside. So, if anybody wants to make any comments, anybody wants to ask any questions, uh, myself or Nuala or Ursula. Harry, can I ask you a question? Like, would you do it again? Well, I know it's a, uh, it's no, it's not a hard question. Hard. I'm not, just, I'm just thinking for I'm going to answer this here. Yeah. I, I have absolutely no regrets in going to jail. Uh, again, the last time I've done 10 years in jail, I was shot in all. Captured. I wouldn't do a day, I wouldn't do a minute if I had known what we have got today. Yeah, I wouldn't do a day for it. Now, I could never ever speak on behalf, and I would never even try to claim to speak on behalf of anybody dead, especially 10 hunger strikers. I would never even try to say that those men died in vain. Because it, it, it didn't. That might be a contradiction of what I'm saying, but for me, on a personal level, 
And I was proud to be there. I met a lot of good men, and, and, that, and I'd say that for all the hardship during that mega protest, it was probably the for my whole time in the IRA and, and, and I, the Republican, being a Republican, uh, it was probably the, the closest I was ever to anybody. And the comradeship, camaraderie, and all that. Sort of. So, in, in, those personal, in that personal level, yes, it was, it was a bit <coughs> It made me what I am today, too. I, I, I don't know what, what I would have ended up. Maybe just being a, not being a lowly bricklayer, as a bricklayer, and a bricklayer, maybe that's all it would have been. Grimaud, Everyone's very shy. Uh, um, first of all, thanks for what I know to be a very modest talk. I mean, there's something for the, or I just want to ask for questions because you mentioned the torch, the, the torture at the start, and just reasons growing up. Like, would you, would you, would people have known then about the guinea pigs and about the psychological sort of stuff that the Brits were up to the time, or was that something they could have told No, we would have known about uh, the guinea pigs, no. Because like a lot of us would have been on protests about the tournament. We would have known about Price Sisters and Jerry Kelly and uh, Hugh Feeney getting force fed and tea. You know, we saw this in protests. We would have been aware of a lot of uh, uh, things about what happened in Castle Ray. And then we were heard in 1978 Brian McGuire was found home in Castle Ray. Now, did he hang himself? Did they hang him? Don't know. So we, we were aware of a, a lot of things that, that were happening in the, in the uh, Castle Rec. We were also aware of the heavy gang and, and the, the CS Stop. You know, seeing what, what happened to the Salons men, we left it, and that was exposed to a lot of this. <coughs> and so we were aware of a lot of uh, torture and what was happening in the torture centers. And just to learn the main chief bake a cara or shoal and a club in a spot and ish obviously big bus a fog of came away. But Kyapri Sarah Nashka and come on. So just to let you know we're gonna have a football match now down at Inish Fall here on the snake. There's gonna be a mini bus leading from outside. Mini bus or a big bus? Mini bus. And there's gonna be sandwiches and Fresh free sandwiches. So, um, just give um, our guest part of the